Hello. Welcome back to the Ask Dr. Be Good show, the show where we bring positive things that are going on in public education, or in this case, um, well-needed information to help with our public school children. We have with us today a special guest, and she is Lee Richardson, a, a uh, clinical director of the Brain Performance Center in Richardson. And let me read a little bit of, a, of an introduction for her. She has spent her educational and professional career learning human behavior. Her focus shifted in 2002 to understanding the role the brain plays in human behavior and how behavior can be modified with the use of neurofeedback and biofeedback. Uh, Lee holds a Master of Science in Counseling from the University of North Texas and is working to integrate cognitive behavioral therapy into treatment programs for many clients. So welcome, Ms. Richardson. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about your Brain Performance Center? Absolutely. You know, the Brain Performance Center really, it, we deal with probably our three biggest groups would be anxiety, depression, and ADHD. And all three of those is just depending on what's going on in the brain, how's the brain getting the right amount of energy, the right amount of fast wave or slow wave, how the brain's sharing information, and the timing in the brain. And at the Brain Performance Center, the first thing we do is we look and we see what is going on in that brain. And then based upon that, we come up with a treatment plan that you can, and we don't use medication, I'm not licensed to manage medication, but we can retrain the brain we can get the brain from a dysregulated state into a regulated state. And really, it's not hard to get that brain dysregulated. There are three things that create dysregulation. One is genetics. Brain waves are just as genetic as how tall you are, or what color eyes you have. Okay. The second is physical head trauma. And people will come in, oh, no, 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 you know, I've never hit my head. Really, did you have a sibling? Because I had a twin brother. And, you know, we liked each other, but we would wrestle and play, and I learned how to ride a bike, and you play the sport, everybody's hit their head. And then the third is emotional trauma, and unfortunately, everybody's had some emotional trauma. Even at the age of four or five, you know, your dog dies, or you, your best friend moves away. So those are the things that really can take that brain from a regulated state and put it into a dysregulated state. And then there's always stress. Anytime your body gets stressed out, and you don't have to be an adult to feel stress. I'm sure you see that in yes. your schools every day. How about around star time? You know, yeah, oh Taking my the goodness. star test. We have kids who can actually make themselves sick over it. Oh, absolutely, because when you get that stress going, you go, you get in that fight or flight mode, mm -hmm. well, this, the central nervous system, kicks off the autonomic nervous system, and that sympathetic takes hold. Those adrenal glands start pumping all that cortisol out, and it can. It can make you nauseous. It can make your heart beat really fast. It can get into the, the gray and the white matter of the brain. It can change the way the brain's wiring and wow. firing. Wow. Well, so let's go backwards a little bit. I want to come back to some of the symptoms of a, of a what do you call it, a dis functional dysregulated Dis dysregulated <clears throat> so uh dysregul i'm going to write that down dysregulated but i want to come back to that but let's go backwards first let's can you talk about the the baby brain and then how it changes over the years i know we the adolescent brain is famous for being um a little um how can we say this special <laughs> Well, you know, you start with it, and basically when you're born, you, your brain is born with all the neurons pretty much that it's going to have. Okay. By the time you're three, your brain's 80% of adult size, and by the time you're six, it's 90 to 95%. Yeah. So the framework is there, but the, it's just starting to develop. The brain develops from the back forward, and in the, think about it. The brain gets information two ways. You see it, it goes to the back of your brain, the occipital lobes. You hear it, it goes into the temporal lobes. From any of those spots, it has to go up a notch to the parietal lobes where you see the peas. That's where you break it down and you process it. So then, you know, you have to send that information up to your frontal lobes so that you can use it. Well, you talked about those special adolescent years, and that those frontal lobes aren't there. Those frontal lobes, and that's what makes that age 9 to 12 to 15 so crucial. 
because those frontal lobes are just starting to develop. And, it, you know, the frontal lobe where you pay attention, you stay on task, you're not impulsive, you think through things like quant consequences, decisions, all of that. It takes your frontal lobes. And when you don't have much there, it's really hard to do. So as that brain develops, once you get to around nine, there's what we call pruning starts to happen, and that happens in the back of the head. And what you're starting to do is those connections that you're not using, use it or lose it, you're starting to get rid of them. And you're starting to strengthen the connections that you are using. And that's why it's so important that you know what a child's brain is exposed to. You know, if it's just exposed to video games, that's a different experience than if it's exposed to music or, you know, to sports or to reading or to art. So are you in agreement that the public schools try to teach the whole child by having art and music along with content area and, and PE? Uh, are you oh, in agreement that that's all very, very necessary? Very, very much in agreement. Okay. Absolutely. That's good to know. We're doing something right. Yay. <laughs> now, how important is PE, exercise, for the well, brain? Well, you know, anytime you exercise, you release endorphins. Mm -hmm. Endorphins make you feel good. And I think it's very important because that mind-body, brain-body connection is very strong. And when you're at that age, when you're younger, you've got all this energy. You know, and now you and I have learned, okay, just stand up, stretch a little bit, come back, sit down, you know. But when you're nine, you haven't learned that. You need that break in the day. You need to burn that energy off. Well, I have luckily I have a Fitbit. When I sit too long, my Fitbit yells at me. So up, up, <laughs> yes, move. So okay, um, what about the teenage brain, the late teen brain? Is it different than the um, middle school brain? Absolutely. So as the brain goes into the teenage stage, those frontal lobes start to develop more. But think about their behavior is really what's changing. They're starting to make decisions. They're starting to test the waters a little bit. They're starting to engage in a little bit of risky behavior. And what happens, because they don't have that, that prefrontal cortex, they use the amygdala, which is down in the brain, for their decision-making process. And that's part of the emotional center. So instead of thinking through decisions, okay, if I do this, this could happen or this could happen. That doesn't happen. I need to make a decision. Oh, oh, I'll do this. And sometimes that's very impulsive. Sometimes it's an emotional reaction. You know, and because that teenage brain is in transition, as parents, it's confusing. One day, you think, oh my gosh, they did so well. They're maturing finally. Thank the Lord, you know. <laughs> and then the next day they do something that's so off the wall and so impulsive that parents don't understand. I'm sure teachers don't understand. Mm -hmm. But what they don't what they don't understand, it's that back front brain connection and it's shifting. And what impacts that is how much sleep have you had? You know, if mm -hmm. as a parent, if you want to do one thing for your child's good brain development, focus on their sleep. Because, you know, all day long, those neurons and dendrites, they're wiring and firing, you know, and they're creating all this toxic waste. And you have these little glial cells, and when you go to sleep, they come out, and they're like those little scrubbing bubbles. They clean all that up. So if you're not getting enough sleep, your brain is really not getting the chance to rejuvenate itself. And more and more research is linking poor sleep and insomnia to Alzheimer's as you age. Yes. Yes, I've seen that. Um, okay, so, so far I've heard for parents and teachers to understand that, first of all, the frontal lobe. The prefrontal cortex, is frontal not, lobes. Is not uh, anywhere near finished developing. That won't get, that really doesn't ma finish maturing until mid to late 20s. Okay. And one thing to remember is everybody's brain is different, you know, because it, when you go into puberty, that's going to impact the hormonal changes. That's going to impact the changes in your brain. So some kids, their brain may change a lot quicker than other kids. Right. You have different maturity levels within the same age, you know, group. So um, they, we've, we've got to 
have our adults understand that they're not uh, fully functioning brains yet and they need sleep to help regulate the brain. I would guess that it would get dysregulated if it, they don't get enough sleep. Is that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So what other, th what other things can impact the child brain? You, you had mentioned trauma and... and um, Emotional, emotional trauma, trauma, physical trauma, stress. And, you know, I think that a lot depends upon the environment that the child is in. Because if you're an only child, you may be expected to act more independently at home than if you're one of three and you're the youngest. And if mom and dad aren't around to look out for you, the big brother or the big sister is. So the environment that you're in, because what that brain needs is nurturing. It needs to be taught how to do some positive thinking. And a lot of times, I mean, we, we all work. I, I was a mom, I worked, I would come home. And a lot of times, you know, we don't have the time to sit down and think, you know, you come in, everybody's got all this negative energy going and you need to make time to say, you know what? Does anybody know what a past positive affirmation is? What's a positive affirmation? It's a positive statement you make about yourself. And there's a great, there's a free app called Think Up, and you can record those affirmations in your own voice. Now, if you get the free version, you can only record four, um, but then you can play those on your phone. And a lot of times, you know, when you're nine years old and you think the world is just about over and nobody likes you, nobody will sit with you, it can really help to hear in your own voice, you're a great kid. You are fabulous. Whatever it is that you need to hear for yourself. So what I'm hearing you say, because that, that's almost trivialized now, the affirmations, but mm -hmm. it really does work, doesn't it? It absolutely does. I Writing mean, them on your bathroom mirror and saying them every day? Absolutely. I mean, I love Tony Robbins. They're not affirmations. They're incarnations. He cranks those <laughs> up. They do work. So can you talk a little bit about uh, how parents can grow and protect the child brain better? What are, what are like three or four major things that a parent can do to help grow and protect their child's brain? Well, I think, you know, when you say protect, I think of when your child is on a, a scooter or a bicycle, wear a helmet. You know, some good basic self safety. Food, diet is very important. Some kids have a very high reaction to sugar. Some kids not at all. It's just like some adults with caffeine. You know, a food diet can create a lot of problems for some kids. Gluten can create a lot of problems for some kids. So be sensitive and monitor your child's diet. Watch what they eat. And when you give them, you know, those bright colored little fruity things and they go off the wall, note, and is it the sugar? Is it the food dye? So, you know, that's one thing that you can look at. I think the best thing that you can do to help develop your child's brain is help them develop some logical thinking. And so when you make a decision, because I made decisions for my kids as long as I could, um, and, but I found that if I sat down and I talked them through the decision, you know, and not, not always, mm -hmm. but when I could, okay, this is the decision, let me explain to you how I came up with that. You know, and it can be as simple as taking a piece of paper, drawing a line down the middle, put the, the good on one side and the bad on the other. Now, you tell me what the right decision is. And they'll get it. They can count by that time. Oh, well, there's eight over here good, you know, but there's 15 over here bad. Right. So I think, you know, connecting with your child, and that takes time, and, and time is the one thing that nobody has enough of. Well, this is just a good reminder for parents. Parents know this, but sometimes they need reminders that they need to take the time to do several things. One is to sit down and, and make sure they're building that relationship with kids, with their own kids. Absolutely. That they don't let the everyday hustle and bustle of today's world, which is way faster than it was when um, we were growing up, um, that they be intentional in their relationship building with their kids. Uh, one of the things that I have said on several podcasts that I ask parents to do weekly is to sit down every either Saturday or Sunday and do a couple things. One is talk about 
what's going on at school. Let's go into the grade portal mm -hmm. online and let's look at your grades. Let's look at missing assignments. Let's talk about what's hap what happened this past week. And uh, then, you know, let's see what we can make up. Let's not be okay with missing uh, grades, with failing grades and so forth. So a, a parent is able to do a couple of things by doing that. One is the child knows that they can't get away with something long term. They have a right. week <laughs> before the next sit down, which tends to keep accountability stronger. Uh, but it, it. But doesn't that send the message too that I care? Yeah. I care about how you're doing in school. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we need. We need kids who know their parents care enough to hold them accountable. It, it doesn't feel good always, but in the long run, it's, it's, they come out better and more in a more positive way. So this is a good reminder. It's also a reminder for parents about uh, the safety, making sure that th we have seat belts on, making sure we're using the car seats, making sure that we're using helmets, um, because you are absolutely right. In the everyday you know, hassle of life, we sometimes let our kids talk us out of a good decision and, oh, mom, I'll be fine by not wearing the helmet when I'm using the skateboard. We're just going right around the corner, you know? It, it, We're not yeah. going far. Right. And I've, I've always remembered a TV commercial of a very famous uh, race car driver. I don't remember his name, but he said, I would not go around the block without putting my seatbelt on. And that's always stuck with me. Wise so, words. You know, when I'm tempted <laughs> to, <laughs> to take the shortcut myself, I don't because... Somebody um, wiser than me has experienced um, what happens when you don't put that seatbelt on. But protecting the brain. How about football? What do you how, what do you feel about football and those type of sports? Well, I'm a Texas girl, so I absolutely love football. But I don't know that. I, I, well, I there's a several in several states are trying to pass a bill that does not let you play tackle football until I believe it's after the age of 12. And I am all for that. And it goes back to the, how crucial the brain development is during those years. You know, and once you hit your head, your brain is a lot more vulnerable for the next, for the next time you hit it. And Boston University, their School of Medicine, put out a really interesting study last year. And it clearly showed that the people that start football young, they're like 13 years quicker they will have cognitive decline and mood problems so their insomnia. brain ages 13 years faster due to concussions and absolutely and so forth. but i mean when you think about it you know being in a home with domestic violence that ages your dna by around seven years so emotional trauma physical trauma it all ages the brain i don't know that most people know that, that 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 can age the brain like that. Um, I, I'm learning something myself. Um, so, uh, and then so I was talking about what parents can learn today from you, um, protecting the brain, building that relationship, food. Uh, you said something that um, really caught my attention about the food dyes. Mm -hmm. So how does that impact the brain? Well, a lot of people that have come into my office, they've tried everything. You know, they've changed, they've taken them off all the, because the food dyes, the gluten, usually it'll do one or two things. It'll make them very impulsive, very hyper, very jumpy, or very fatigued. Okay. And either way, it affects their ability to perform. Either they can't go to school and sit still, or they can't go to school and, you know, stay awake. Uh, it definitely impacts how your brain and your body connect. So it, if you were raising a child today, what would you give your child to eat? What do you think is the perfect diet for building the perfect brain? Well, I think it would be very balanced. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to approach diet. There's the book, Eat for Your Blood Type. Uh, and I think that my advice, well, I would do as a parent, I would do observation and just see how food affects my child. Certainly try to get the right amount of protein in. Protein is very important. Try to get the right amount of fruits and vegetables. Try to get the right amount of carbs, good carbs, not bad carbs. But I think the main thing that you have to do is see how that food affects your child. 
because there's no it's not as easy as you you do one two three because one two three may work well for one child but it may not work at all for the other child so as we um getting low on time here i, I do want to go back to the d dysregulated brain can you talk about how to get a dysregulated brain back regulated okay well, I think that there's, you know, different things that you can do. Of course, I take the approach of using neurofeedback, which is brainwave biofeedback. And what that does is that trains the brain how to get into a regulated state. Not everybody can go that route. And I think that there are other things that you can do. You can use things like focus on your breathing. You know, if you're really anxious and you get really anxious, what you'll notice, you'll start to breathe real short, choppy breaths. 65% of the phone calls that go in to 911, I'm having a heart attack, I'm having a heart attack. They're having a panic attack. But they think they're having a heart attack because they feel like their heart's beating so hard. So focus on your breathing, you know? I always say get grounded, put your feet on the floor. I like to put my hands on my knees. It gives me a sense of a connection to the ground and focus on really slow, deep breathing. And you've got to get some action around your belly button. What if does that mean? That means you've got to feel your, your gut going in and out. Because if, if you're not feeling it there, you're not doing slow, deep breathing. You know, or I'll tell kids, lay on the floor, put a book on your stomach. If you can't see that book move, you're not doing slow, deep breathing. And that's something that everybody can work on. You change your breath rate, you change your heart rate. You do that, you create heart rate variability, and that's wellness. And how will that affect your brain? It calms the brain down. And trust me, it takes a lot of focus to do that slow, deep breathing. It's not easy. So you're making me think of the sort of... The, in the last few years, we've had a term called mindfulness mm -hmm. come up. Absolutely. Is that... Is that Mount somewhat what you're talking about, to be more mindful of self? Well, it, yes. And to me, mindfulness is just staying present. Stay in the moment. There was a guy at Harvard, and I forget his name, but he wrote a study, and he said 80% of us are either A, lost in the past, or B, worried about the future. Stay in the present. Because if you're not lost in the past or worrying about the future, you're, you're calmer. You're accepting things as they are. And to me, that's what mindfulness is, is just staying present. And using your breathing is a real good way to kind of bring yourself inward as well. Okay. So work more on mindfulness. And, and gratitude. That's true, too. I mean, mm -hmm. gratitude. Every day, think of three things that you're grateful for. And, you know, I do that, and some days it's the same three things it was yesterday. But is that's it, okay. I'm still grateful for them. Is it better to do it in the morning or uh, before you go to bed? When when is that talk good? I think to that's do? whatever's good for you. You know, I sometimes I do it before I go to bed is kind of my way of closing down the day, and sometimes I'll do it in the morning as my way of opening the day. You had referred to something, and I and that probably we could do a whole podcast on it all by itself. But I'll give you a few uh, give you three minutes, uh, and that is what impact are this device use having on the kid brain? When you say device use, I'm going to include internet, gaming, cell phone, social media, and all of that. You know, what happens when we start using, whether it's our phone or our video game, starts off, you know, it feels good. We enjoy doing it. So in the brain, those neurotransmitters start to transmit dopamine. Dopamine is a really feel-good neurotransmitter. So it starts off, oh, I like this. You know, I really like this. And then it got those little nerve cells. If you, if you keep doing that same activity a lot and very intensely, those little nerve cells, they get confused. It goes from, oh, I like this, to, oh, I want this. I want to do this. And then it goes to, oh, I need this. And that's really... There's a whole, that dopamine, there's an addiction network in the brain. Addiction is a brain disease. So how, when you, and I'm not saying all video or, or cell phone or Facebook is bad, but you've got to put 
some limitations around it. And, and it's easy. If, you, if your kid can't find their cell charger and they're having a major meltdown, that's a red flag. They may be addicted. All right. Um, well, so y- we've learned so much in this uh, just short period of time. Is there anything that you want to leave us with as the three most important things to remember about our brain? And I, I'll take it from a, pr- a parent or, or, you know, because we have adults listening, that we want our our adults to understand about the brain so that it leads to possibly a change in behavior f- towards their children. One, it's a work in progress. You have to appreciate that. Two, as like everything that's in progress, it needs to be nurtured for it to grow. And three, it needs it needs a little love. It needs to be taken care of. Okay. So, uh, again, I think for many parents, it's, this is a good reminder to do that, to take mm-hmm. the time to, to not be so busy uh, that we don't take the time to see our kids. And when you think they're not thinking through things, you're right. They're not, but understand why they're not. They don't have very much in the frontal lobes. They don't get much help. Yeah, that's, that's a big one right there, and, and that's for teachers as well. All right, well, you know, this show is called the Ask Dr. Be Good Show. So um, is there anything that you would like to ask me? Well, y- you know, in, in your schools, what is the, big, the one biggest challenge that you think that if people become more aware of their brain that you could change? That's... Gosh, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would want our adults, and and again, parents and our staff, because it's not only teachers who influence kids, but it's to think of the behavior of the children as age appropriate. And I know that's sort of a funny thing to say, but it's... I, I, I had to on many occasions when we pull a parent, especially when I was principal, when we would pull a parent in because a child had been caught lying, and the parent would say, my child doesn't lie. And and I would have to say to the child parent, you know what, it is age appropriate for your third grader to be lying. It is how the adults respond to that instant that will help the child decide whether they want to lie next time again or not. And so it's it's okay for we, for us to be in this situation. But let's partner together to see how we can encourage your child to make a different decision ar- around the, the comeback, you know, when they're caught in an uncomfortable situation. And so it's, again, I think it all leads to that understanding the brain, understanding that third graders are gonna lie, fifth graders are gonna lie. Um, s- they even sometimes take things that don't belong to them, but it's, it's about understanding that that's age appropriate, but it's how the adults approach the kids as to whether the kids decide whether that's a safe enough thing to do again in the future or not. So it's a good point. That's so a very good point. Helping our adults be less, um, d- less judgmental with our children as far as their behavior, especially behavior that is not necessarily a behavior that they think is good behavior, is something that we constantly work in. We uh, are in our third year of restorative practice, as I shared with you earlier, um, off off the show, and helping our adults understand their kids and now their brains better through building a relationship with them so that when a child misbehaves, it's not that we want to instinctively punish them. We want to help them understand the harm that they've done to our classroom community that we've built up during the year. Again, all brain related. Mm-hmm. They may not even you know realize that, but um, you've helped me understand better the relationship between the body and the brain. You know, when you were talking about the breathing, mm-hmm. breathing relaxes the brain. It, it, it's all connected. And so understanding the relationship of our body parts, our relationship with our kids, relationship um, between 
you know, all of us, it, it all boils down to how, how our brains work. So thank you for coming on and talking to us about this very pivotal uh, subject. I can see that we may need to come back later and maybe talk more about those three, the ADHD, the anxiety, anxiety and depression. depression, because unfortunately we're seeing a lot more of that in our schools. And I'm amazed at how young that we're seeing it. Yeah, we have, we have pre-suicidals um, on a pretty regular basis now in both Mesquite and Plano, and I have actually lost one. Uh, recently so let's let's uh, put that in our future All and right. so thank you very much for being here we thank um, Lee Richardson from the Brain Performance Center and if you want more information about the Brain Performance Center please see the link that is in the uh, Facebook post Dr. Thank B. you Good for show. having me. For more information on Legacy Preparatory Charter Schools, visit our website, LegacyPCA.com, or call 469-249-1099. And remember to like us on Facebook, where we stream live weekly Tuesdays at 3 p.m.